Welcome everybody to Learn With Lowell. Today we're continuing our series on longevity and health span with Dr. Amit Sharma. He is at the SENS Research Foundation, which we've had several people on, including Michael and Lisa, the CEO or president, I forget her title actually. Uh, he is CEO. He is working as a senior investigator and group lead for the Sen Senescence Immunology Research Group, the Senescence Immunology Research Group of Mild Dyslexia. So when I look at things, <laughs> I all that just turned into hieroglyphics when I looked at it. But uh, welcome to the show, Amit. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Yes. So one, I was reading about the different things you could be working on, and there seemed in the research three different pathways to take to essentially alleviate senescence, senescent cells. Uh, it was rejuvenation, destruction, or removal of senescent cells. And so I'm curious just on the, on the upfront, which path do you like, or that do you think holds the most promise to get uh, people what they really want, which is longevity and health span? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see a difference between those three. Mm. I think they're kind of interrelated and necessary. I think by removing the damaged cells, depending on when we are removing them, rejuvenation may become absolutely necessary for giving us the actual full benefits of you know health span and lifespan that people are mostly looking for. What we do in my lab is uh, is mainly focused on understanding how the the immune system uh, aging affects their natural ability to maintain homeostasis in our body. Uh, so senescent cells uh, are, are important cells in our body. They, they do some important things like wound healing, tissue repair, regeneration. So they're required, they're necessary. And if you, if you got rid of them, then you know, it, it would become a problem uh, as well. So, so we've evolved uh, mechanisms in our immune system to find senescent cells and kill them effectively and maintain some level of homeostasis. And that, dis that homeostasis is what disrupts as we age. And what we're trying to understand is what, what causes that and how to correct for that. Um, that is, that is one, at least one part of what we do. So an integrated approach. I, I hear, that's one of the big things that I've, I've wondered about and I've questioned about. Is if you remove the senescent cells, like is the body just going to naturally... Uh, start popping back, you know, because uh, at some point, um, I was talking to someone, I think the t episode the episode today was with Danielle Ruiz of uh, Everest Health Partners, which is like a longevity health care clinic. She says, like, that, you know, the sooner you can stop the damage, the better, but there is sometimes, like, stratification of damage where it won't, like, you won't go all the way back to, like, a completely 100% health state. And so mm -hmm. I always wonder, like, um, it, it, it can't be just, like, removal, like you're saying, like, like you said, it has to be an integrated approach to really have like maximized longevity and health span. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I agree with that sentiment. I think um, it's important to get rid of the damage for sure. But depending on when you got rid of the damage, you may be at a point of no return. And then maybe rejuvenation has to be integrated into that. Um, but there is definite value in redu reducing damage or removing damage because you can at least prevent further damage. At any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. So in people who are suffering from diseases where, uh, where we know senescent cells make it worse, getting rid, getting rid of the senescent cells would at least prevent it from getting worse, like, you know, even, even worse from there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I'm up, I've been asking this question more and more because the, the answers are varied. And I think it is really fun to hear what people actually do in their daily lives when, when it comes to work um, versus like, I'm a research investigator. You know, like, what does that mean? So I'm, I am curious, what is what does a day or a week look like for you? Like, we're we're talking on Friday, so it's like a good time to ask you and reflect on your week, I guess. But like, how, yeah, yeah. look back and see what my mm -hmm. week was. Well, um, I um, my typical day is, um, you know, I would I would generally come in the morning, you know, go over, uh, you know, plan for the day. Then I try have meetings with people in my group to discuss their experiments, you know, like what worked, what didn't work, what kinds of problems they are, uh, they are having and try to solve those problems for them, you know, keep writing programs um, to get, you know, more funding. Uh, then the thing that, that I like the most is then being able to just pop into, you know, somebody's cubicle and, and, and go over, you know, the data, something that didn't make sense. Um, and we, we like, it's just, you know, like playing in our head and then try and figure out uh, what that means. Like as an example, you know, one of the things, like one of the lines that we've taken now that we weren't really looking into at all. Um, and part of, for instance, like just going to back on a little bit. So part of what we do in my lab was to see how can we, design NK cells 
to natural killer cells to improve their ability to find and remove senescent cells. So they have a natural ability. What we have done, at least in our lab, we, we think that ability declines with age. We think, how can we make it better? So there is a way we can engineer receptors that they can recognize senescent cells from. So we've done like some proteomics to figure out you know, novel antigens that we can find on senescent cells to then, 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 then engineer you know, ways to kill them based on that. But when we did our uh, analyses, we found a whole bunch of proteins that, that were not supposed to be there at all. Um, and we couldn't understand because a lot of those proteins were actually intracellular proteins. So some of them were enzymes. And we had no idea how these proteins would be even presented on the surface. And when we kept thinking about it, you know, put it on the on the side because that wasn't what we were going for anyway. But this this thing kept nagging me in my head, like, why would that happen? Um, you know, and then we had this casual conversations, you know, just something like this. We were sitting around discussing this and bouncing ideas back and forth. And, and we thought... Maybe there is a common mechanism, a common thread between those, and we found, and then we, we thought, okay, what if what if we blocked this? What if we prevented that from happening? What happens then? Um, and fortunately, we found some chemical uh, compounds that we could use to do that, and we did, and we found that, oh, now we have a new way of killing senescent cells. And, and guess what? They're much, much better and safer than the drugs that people are testing now. So we have like a whole new project started from something, you know, just like sitting around conversations. So that is a lot of what I do, you know try to look at, uh, you know, uh, experiments, think of big picture and try to put it all together and see how can we uh, find new ways um, to understand the biology of aging. It kind of reminds me of the, I've been reading a lot about Bell Labs and it kind of feels like that type of approach where um, it, sometimes it feels like when I hear about research organizations, more like uh, research labs, they're usually like so focused that when they mm -hmm. see these really kind of like, what what is that? What is that? Like they, they can't really go down and explore it unless it's a part of their research funding because they just won't be supported to do that mm -hmm. um but what you're doing kind of sounds like bell labs where like they would they would have meetings like that and they would hear oh have you seen this or this guy has this like weird thing that they discovered and then they would like just bunt off like three people and start working on it and then you know like you get a transistor or, or you know a yeah. microprocessor or something from that so it sounds like this is like the equivalent of like well i guess we'll know in time if it's like a microprocessor in terms of some act, mm -hmm. but like finding something like those uh I think they call it like black swan events or whatever, like something that you don't yeah. even know is there. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the beauty of this foundation, honestly. Like Sense Foundation, by by removing the 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 absolute need for us to find funding ourselves and giving us initial money to be able to do our projects, they freed us from that fear that we have to produce outcome right right away. And that allowed us to be a little bit more creative. And 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 has the culture has been like this all along, like from the very beginning. That don't don't worry about the timelines worry about you know finding real solutions to the problem if it is a longer timeline then so be it and and that allowed us to you know think about problems creatively and come up with solutions that were uh, a little bit high risk but possibly high reward mm -hmm. is yeah. there the foundation is important for for fostering that kind of uh, innovation mm -hmm. is there is there um is there something that you've wanted to work on but that's like too high risk for the reward or are there like are there things in your mind that are like man i i can't wait till we get to the point where i can start working on that oh yeah <laughs> there are there are there are like lots of different projects that i have those in my mind yeah i mean there is a cost issue um and there is mm -hmm. also a time issue you have to like you know finish some things that you've started so you can start some new things you know things like that oh i have lots of ideas like that yeah <laughs> uh, i think elon musk said he can't turn it off I think like when when um a lot of people message and they say like how do I start thinking of ideas and it seems like one of the suggestion I always give is like um to start noticing things in your environment that you can improve like slightly like what if you made uh your shoes out of a different material or whatever like what would that do to like its functionality and longevity or like anything really like what if you move the the stop sign like a fifty feet forward or whatever like how would that affect traffic um, but it sounds like like uh so the question I'm curious for you is like can you can you shut it off like the no. the innovation brain yeah okay. No, I can't. I mean, I'm no Elon Musk. I'm not even close to you know this guy. I've been actually listening uh, to his book by Walter Isaacson. Have you? Ah, oh, yes, I bought it. Yeah, it's right behind us. I am. Um, yes, I have this. Amazing. Everyone, I, you're the third person I've talked to this week who's re is reading it too. Amazing. I mean, first of all, the guy is amazing author. You know, Walter uh, written some really cool stuff before. I like the, his narrative style. And then Elon Musk itself, like such an amazing, you know, unbelievably inspiring person. 
I've ever oh, yeah. one so of his books. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I, I can't. I mean, what ends up happening with me, and uh, I can do trouble with my wife a lot with this. Like, I have this chaotic way of thinking. I'm actually dyslexic too. So I have a very mm-hmm. chaotic way of thinking uh, about ideas and I get into this like manic state where I'm constantly reading papers, writing stuff, you know, planning stuff and, and you know, kind of a pain, or pain in the ass for my team as well. I keep throwing ideas at them all, <laughs> all the time. And then there are these occasions like I keep doing it for, you know, uh, months and then there will be like a couple of days when my mind is completely tired and all I need to mm-hmm. do, like I'll, I'll have to sleep for 12 hours or so to, to, to get over that, that exhaustion. But yeah, I, I don't think I get tired at all. Yeah. But I was I was reading and I don't know if this is true. So I'm curious uh, if, to corroborate it with an anecdotal evidence of how you think. But I, I've read that um, people who are dyslexia, we we think in 3D. We're like uh, other people will think more in 2D. So do you think in 3D? I, yeah, I absolutely 100 percent. So I um, I think in uh, shapes, you know, so when I'm, mm. uh, I'm uh, when I'm thinking of a concept, I literally see a video in my head about you know so if i'm thinking of uh, like you know simple simple example like natural killer cells finding and killing senescent cells i don't see a text i see cells moving uh, you know through our bloodstream looking at that homing signal like those uh, those uh, chemokines that are produced from senescent cells finding their looking at the surface, looking at the activating inhibitor receptor density and, and then killing them um, I, I so so literally i see a video in my head yeah, I think the, the, and I don't know if you probably would be able to relate to that. Is I think what I've found is often it has happened to me enough times where we would all be sitting around looking at the same piece of data and I'm able to see something and I, I, I tell people that, what about this? Um, and, and they would say, oh yeah, that sounds pretty obvious, but nobody noticed it before. Mm-hmm. So only when you point it, and a lot of I've heard, uh, so many times I've heard when I've come up with ideas to work on that, Hey, uh, I cannot believe that people haven't done this before mm-hmm. or haven't tested this before. And then we go at literature, we find that it hasn't been done before, tested before. So that's been pretty much the story of my, and a part of it is, I think, my dyslexia. But that makes me really, really bad in math. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, it sounds like all, I, my guess would be that when people who work with you suggest ideas as well or like, like are having problems and you guys are all workshopping it, they can see the value of their idea really quickly i think sometimes when people work for others it's like they have to really pitch hard to get like mm-hmm. a, a boss or a leader to like hear their ideas but i imagine like if you can as soon as someone says like hey have you thought about this you were like immediately starting to picture it it's really easy for you to like slot it in and see the opportunities yeah and i i really encourage that a lot i think the science is now especially now it's like a collective endeavor you know one person can achieve anything you have to work together with people and and the way i've like worked with my my group is that i've there's no hierarchy. Everybody's the same. All ideas are good. Everything goes on the table. Um, and, and the best idea wins. It's as simple as that. And I am the first one to acknowledge that, okay, mine wasn't the best one. Yours is. Um, and I think people feel empowered by that. And then it opens up the room a lot for, for the kind of stuff that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I always surprise. Like, I guess it doesn't surprise me because um, I've seen it a lot. But like, it's so odd to me that people don't treat their teams that way they're like no i'm the boss you guys do as a tone it's like all right if you're always telling them what to do and they're only ever going to do what you tell them to do <laughs> but you want you don't want like if you were in their position i was thinking like, how can i create if i'm like working with someone or a part, someone's working with me if i talk to them i want them to talk to them in a way where like if i was on the receiving end mm-hmm. on my worst day i would still like what, what i'm saying being, mm-hmm. being spoken to and so it's like i would want to be like you said well you have to do you have to like i require you to blah, blah, blah. i'd be like hey here's the structure the problem we're having you know, uh, what do you think about solving it? And let's work together and like doing that. Like that's, that's like more, it's actually fun. Um, yeah. I think that my, my guess now is that now I'm just thinking out loud, but I, I bet it's probably like that, like K through 12, I uh, trying to manufacture people for, uh, for factories. Uh, mm-hmm. it's probably cause you have to like, you know, just like do the assembly line. But those assembly lines are really kind of going away. And a lot of, uh, manufacturers now are like extremely skilled labor. Um, yeah. so like, yeah. I, 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 I was just thinking like, is there any place where that mentality is useful. Not even like the military doesn't just tell people what to do either. Like uh, special oh. forces people, they're like mm-hmm. very much like that type of organization. Yeah, yeah. I actually like speaking of special forces, uh, I, I actually, my leadership style is about this, like this guy, Simon Sedek wrote a book about, uh, it's called Leaders Eat Last. Have mm-hmm. you read it? So in that book, oh. he talks about how the, the leadership, like traditional leadership is, you know, the alpha male telling people what to do, you know, leading from the front, all of that. 
he has kind of turned it around on his head. It, it said the leadership is the ability to give people confidence, to be able to grow and express themselves and feel, uh, you know, more more connected with the job they're doing, have like a sense of ownership of what they're doing, and the role of the leader is to 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 part to you know give them messages or you know like stuff that I've learned from my experience that hey this may work this may not work, or mostly uh, you know take obstacles out of the way and let them succeed uh, that's the kind of leadership i tend to follow uh, or at least try to you know not all perfect but but that's that's how i feel and i think once people have a sense of ownership of an idea they're not just doing what you're telling them to do they feel more involved in it they 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 they, they think it's your vision is their vision um, and and it is and then they then they are as invested in it as you are mm-hmm. You know, that's that's at least what I've learned from you know, with my experience in the way of kind of trying to manage my team here. The it's very much like a startup mentality. Is there is there any desire at once uh, some of this um, the research you've done has gotten to this certain point, like amino sans, adaptive sans, any of these ones out, that are out there that at a certain point that you'd want to help spin it off, like and t- just keep going with it, or do you kind of like the idea that re- uh, sends allows you to just work on so many different projects? Like that's like the fun part. So I. That's an interesting question. So I have thought about this. We talked about this internally as well. I like the idea of like looking into the unknown um, mm-hmm. and pick up difficult problems and and get to that get get it to a stage where like somebody could then move ahead and and spin it out, and I'll help that person do it. And I keep encouraging my my teammates. Like if people are interested in starting something up, then they can continue. They I have no problems at all with that. But personally, that doesn't excite me that much. Like personally, mm-hmm. as, a, as a scientist. I rather go find another difficult problem to tackle, find solutions to this, bring it to a place where it can now become a medicine or something that people can, you know, move forward with. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like a it's like a the I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Langer. Most people are familiar with George Church, but the, it sounds like similar models to to them. Where Bob Langer, he's like a little bit more. I think he owns like ten percent Moderna, but like he's a little bit more hands on, <laughs> which is like good for him. <laughs> but uh, Charles Church is kind of like the the guy who like he supports the his the fellows or the PhDs underneath him, and then he like mentors them so they, they can spin out the different ideas. Yeah. And he's like the the hub that uh like the VIS has to like you know draw on funding, and he gets to have his fun too. So it kind of seems yeah. like that. Yeah, and I'm also too like I I'm a little too indisciplined. <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> to things. So that's the other thing. I, that's a different like skill set that people need to 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 be able to do that kind of work. I like the idea of like the chaos and and thinking of different ideas at a given time. That's how my mind works the best. You know, like thinking of five or six different problems at a given time and like finding ways to connect them or or fig- figuring out that they, they don't. And things like that's what drives me. That's what excites me the most. Yeah, and I think the I imagine it's the, also the problem set. So like in startups, there are a lot of like. Uh, explosions everywhere and you have to put out the fires, right? So it, it's mm-hmm. similar to like having so many different things to work on. But I think the what I'm hearing is that it's also the problem sets you enjoy. It's the science side of the problems that are going wrong. Yeah. That's or like the opportunism that's that's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's how it is for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um the how much uh just for you personally, how much was like mentorship? Because people always talk about mentors and it, getting advice and that type of thing. And you have you have a degree, so like there's a mentor somewhere in there. But the, <laughs> the how much um how much what, did mentors influence you to get where you are now? And then um, I'm always wondering, is, was there advice in particular that helped you see that this was the right path for yourself? I mean, uh, mentors are very, very important. I, I can name a few, you know, from the very uh, the beginning. I mean, I grew up in India, um, uh, did my PhD back there, and I have some very important teachers who played a very important role, in, you know, in my life. My father was an amazing inspiration for me growing up. You know, my both my parents really like, but but my father, especially, you know, he has like had a difficult childhood and how he, uh, you know, overcome extreme abject poverty and 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 you know, bought, got himself into medical school, became a doctor. Um, he was very invested from the very beginning in in letting me express myself. Uh, you know, question everything. Uh, um, but I know, like from ev- from from as long as I can remember, from you know, from a very very early age, I only wanted to be a scientist. Like I remember that I still have stuff written down. You know, my mom was showing me the other day stuff. You know that that you that you write to in school, like what you're going to be when you grow up, things like that. 
So I've always been driven by science, fascinated by science. There were people, teachers in my life, uh, who gave me the the confidence that you know this would be that I can do it. You know, so it's absolutely essential that that I was able to see this path that this was there for me. Um, and uh, there were like important people you know, in the process who 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 were at the right place at the right time to um, to let me let me get here. Is there other? I think that's wild. Um, Michael Levin is another person like yourself who like knew when he was like eight that he wanted to like people who just like kind of know. Uh, I think it's just like such a special like this such a rare thing, or maybe it's like it's not rare. And people just like need to like have a better sense of like listening to themselves, depending on their environment. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not a psychologist, but the I do think it's awesome when people know they can keep going in that direction. Are there now that but now that you're in it um, and you're in in your role that you're very happy with? Are there um, are there skills? Or experiences that would surprise people that require that are required to have to be successful at what you do. We've kind of been talking about them so far, but I'm thinking of this from the perspective of someone listening in, thinking like, "Well, I've liked I've liked a lot of what you're saying. I've liked a lot of the people in the uh, the longevity series, and they're always wanting to find opportunities to get in and to, like help out. So, what mm-hmm. would I'm, I'm thinking from the perspective of like, what would someone listening in need to do to get where you are, essentially, and what skills that type of thing? Yeah, I mean. Um... I think everybody is a scientist when, when we are born, right? Yeah. And at some point in time, we slowly get less and less interested in uh, looking at the unknown, but, you know, more, more interested. So I think keeping that childlike enthusiasm to find problems exciting and solving them is important um, for people to look into, you know, being able to use your imagination to to um, to think about things in it like i think you also said something like that when when you look at a problem and try to look at it from different different you know point of views uh what would happen if this or what would happen if that and not be fearful of asking those questions research is hard because there is a lot of failure i mean 90 percent of what we do ends up in a failure anybody will tell you who's doing this so you should be able to handle that well um and and this is I mean I know it's not what you're asking probably going to discourage a whole bunch of people but maybe encourage a few. Uh, I keep like when a new person comes to my group, uh, one of the things I, I tell them from my experience is like, look, there's not a whole lot of money. Um, you will be spending a lot of time, you know, doing your PhD, your postdoc, you know, spending a, many many hours in a research lab. Um, to to solve, uh, you know, you do your experiments. Most of them wouldn't work. Um, your friends will make money. They will have like careers, you know, families and everything. And you would still be in a lab doing stuff. Um, and there will be doubt, a lot of it in your mind, whether you've done the right thing or not. And then you probably will have to make decisions on this. But end of the day, when you are able to make that that discovery, that 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 new thing that you found that nobody else on the entire planet in the entire uh, you know, some total of uh, of humanity has ever found. You've you got this this knowledge that you're adding to our, you know, like um, like collective uh, knowledge. That feeling of the only person who knows this one thing about the nature that nobody else does. That is the most amazing feeling. There's nothing else that tops that. And and if you can tap into that 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 feeling of that you get by by doing the work we do. Uh, that is the most fulfilling profession. I've always come to work full of excitement and enthusiasm because every day is exciting, you know. So I don't know who said that, but somebody very famous said this: like if if you absolutely enjoy doing what you what you you know do for a living, then you'd never work for a living or your whole life, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think also the I think sometimes people think that they look at the other people doing X, Y, and Z, and they think, oh, their lives are better, right? But I, I bet I feel like you walked in that person's shoes, like, you wouldn't like it either. You know, like, the people doing all the things they have to do to have that that uh, different lifestyle than you have. At the same time, it's like, you can't, you don't get to take any of this stuff with you. You know, like, you only get the experiences and what you do um, mm-hmm. today. So at a certain point, it's like, at a certain point, it's like, how much, you know, how much more do you really need in life? Like, if, mm-hmm. if, if you have stuff that's fulfilling, if you have a family, etc., like, you basically have, you, like, want, you, it's like, um, I think so, uh, someone made this joke where like Bill Gates essentially like won the video game is now just doing side quests. Like he's, <laughs> he's just having fun. <laughs> it's just kind of like that, you know. Like uh, you won the game at that point, and now you're just you, know, you just enjoy it and like live it. Yeah. And then you can find side quests like Bill Gates, um, yeah. you know, traveling or whatever that may be. Um, yeah. I'm curious. The uh, and we may have mentioned it earlier, but 
are there um is there a project at sense that you're really uh proud of or that you uh that is more of the past like something that you've done or that sense has done while you work there that you're like that you don't normally get to talk about because there's a lot of stuff like especially if you come in every day excited i bet there's like like tons of stuff that you just like no one ever gets to hear or see i mean um uh, you mean at, at like the work that i was directly involved in or something that i i was around and sense was doing that kind of work is is that i'm, I'm just yeah, trying yeah. To- well i might i might use specifically but now i'm curious what you, if there's something to purchase in general <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the idea of sense itself is amazing, if you think about it, like the strategies of engineering negligible cell sense. I mean, the idea uh, of of looking at aging in an, in a way where you have found out the, these these seven different kinds of damages um, that, that are accumulating. And if you really break it down, then you know, a lot of those could be could be tackled, could be could be changed. When this idea was initially proposed, uh, there was a lot of pushback. People did not buy into it. But now it has kind of become mainstream to to a great degree. I'm very proud of being associated with you know, with a foundation like that. Um, regarding the work personally that that we're involved in, or um, so recently this 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 approach that I was talking about, like a novel vulnerability of senescent cells, being able to target them by by messing with the ability of senescent cells to repair themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're doing some in vivo experiments right now. Some mouse data should be coming soon, and we would communicate this paper out pretty soon. I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I think um, previously we've done some work where we we found that actually um, iron uh, is some um, uh, the senescent cells accumulate a lot of iron, and their inability to handle that much iron can be used as a way to kill them. So up until you know, a few years ago, we only knew one way of killing senescent cells. We would um, we would lower the uh, the genes that are allowing them to survive apoptosis, not undergo apoptosis, and that's the only way we were killing them. In my lab, we found now um, two different ways in addition to that 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 we could use to kill them. So I, I I'm very proud of proud of that. Why do they hoard iron? I think I think Michael uh, Ray and I may have discussed this as well. So we talked about iron mm-hmm. in that episode. Like, I, I, yeah. um, why are they so hoarders of iron? So all of the cells in our body are. Mm. Uh, okay. Some some more than the other. Uh, we haven't figured out evolutionarily how to get rid of iron once it comes in the cell. I mean, more, what ends up happening is that uh, a lot of iron that comes in um, gets stored in a way which is like non-toxic um, mm. and not not really bad. Uh, it is Fe three plus form, the fer- uh, the, the ferric form. Um, and it is stored that way, no problem at all. Senescent cells, because of other things that happen to them, the increased oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, lysosomal dysfunction, uh, become really increasingly bad at this. So instead of like them storing iron within the lysosome, where it can be packed up and stored with proteins in a way which is not damaging, it starts leaking out into the cytosol. And that iron, that free iron starts reacting with stuff it shouldn't be reacting with and then further makes the problem like bad. Now, senescent cells are very good in escaping cell death. Typical cells would die by ferroptosis because of this iron that builds up. Senescent cells don't. They resist it just like they resist apoptosis. So we found that we could deliver a prodrug, which um, that prodrug is is normally protected um, and, and the toxin is 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 not released and it's like inert. It doesn't do anything. But when you go into a cell that has a very high level of labile iron load, the uh, the 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 Fe two plus iron load, that starts reacting with the prodrug. The same reaction is called fenton reaction. So, uh, fenton reaction is what where labile iron uh, you know reacts with other things in our body. It's called fenton reaction and causes oxidative stress. It reacts with lipids, reacts with proteins, and 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 releases free free radicals. The same reaction then can be used to release the drug from the prodrug molecule, and then that starts killing senescent cells. And we found it to be selective um, to senescent cells, and non senescent cells apparently are doing really well. They're completely fine, nothing happens to them. Uh, we started doing some in, in vivo experiments with that drug. So, in vitro, that's the paper we published last year showing that um, this can be a very safe way of killing senescent cells. Um, and, and, uh, and now we're, we're trying to check in mouse models and see how effective this approach is i'm trying to picture it uh like i'm trying to imagine the steps to this process 
and um visually i imagine it's like the 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 pharaoh process um like they they enter the cell and it kind of like um binds the i I imagine like that's one of the key things like you said that are separating like the synthetic cells from the other ones is the fact that there's just so much iron there so if the the drug or the intervention were to go to normal cell it just wouldn't do anything because there's not enough iron to like make it you know uh induce its change and so i think i see like in my mind like two two cells one with like a lot a lot of iron in it it looks kind of silly but the other one with uh uh no iron in it and so one of the iron when it enters it it kind of i'm picture is like making it explode but uh it's probably not right so how how do you visualize this process i because i imagine it's probably not ex- like a like an explosion well um it's it's kind of like apoptosis but okay. by a different mechanism so okay traditionally like um like ferroptosis with with literally cell will explode that's pretty much what yeah. happens in ferroptosis kind of not like some more right yeah. but in this case uh, cell will will be pushed further into apoptotic cycle so normally mm. uh, senescent cell has all of the proteins required for apoptosis to occur to occur but they do not happen because they have also upregulated certain proteins called uh, pro survival uh, proteins like bcl family proteins which which prevent the cells to execute this apoptosis phenomenon that's why a lot of people call them like undead cells or like zombie cells so they are like our normal cells except they are uh, supposed to die if you if you if you phenotype them they should die more cells in that that state of uh, molecular signature should die but they don't um so what we are doing is we just pushing them over the edge and then eventually uh, we are the pro apoptotic signals are are stronger than the 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 pro survival signals and and they are end up under, undergoing apoptosis in a safe way so what is going on here is that um, the cell which has high level of labile iron unlike other cell will start reacting to the drug and mm-hmm. then start releasing the toxin in the cell and then cell is as pushed over the edge and they die it kind of sounds the like, i was talking about uh there are many cancers that basically inhibit the immune system from attacking them like they, they do something mm-hmm. i don't remember what something is but it basically stops the immune system's response mm-hmm. kind of like this adip- uh apoptosis prevention of like it going further because of these proteins uh mm-hmm. like uh cancer kind of stops our immune system from a seeing them and then when they, they can't see them like uh that, that they hide in plain sight and stuff so then they can get bigger and attack people um is there mm-hmm. i think this like parallelism is the is the is this process that you found could it be applied for other things that are affecting the immune system like could could you like use it to um like um hit that process that is stopping the immune system from seeing cancer and like fighting cancer with our immune system or is, so is there other uses outside of just uh attacking senescent cells as uh, zombie cells oh no absolutely like so actually the other way around is known so people have already shown the people who collaborated with from UCSF who developed this drug have had developed this drug to to target cancer cells too okay so cancer cells use similar mechanisms of storing the iron and protecting them from dying the the immune all of the work we we know how the immune system interacts with senescent cells actually came from initial observations made with cancer biology they use similar mechanisms to to protect themselves from the immune system like one mechanism that is pretty conserved between cancer um like if i were to boil it down in the most simplistic terms then uh, we have a fine tuning mechanism um in our body where not everything gets attacked when it's under stress you know so they we want to give individual cells an opportunity to heal itself and pre- and prevent themselves from dying and the way they do that is by demonstrating certain certain kinds of signals that we say like we call them like uh, don't eat me signal mm-hmm. so an immune cell whenever it looks at the target cell it tries to to scan the surface and figure out if there are more uh, eat me signal or don't eat me signals and depending mm-hmm. on the relative density it decides whether to kill a cell or not cancer cell and senescent cell has figured out how to hijack that system and even though they they should be removed they have figured out how to tell the immune system that i'm trying to repair and don't get rid of me just yet that's pretty much what 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 ends up happening and by by understanding that process by messing with that process we can enhance the killing the problem is though there are other cells in our body where the signal is necessary for preventing us from attacking and killing them and we want to when to find how that transient signal is different from the one that we're trying to target that's the key I think uh, I was uh, this is like on a Reddit AMA or something so I don't know this is probably not real so like this you'll be able to like confirm or deny this but uh okay. someone was saying that our immune system is not aware of our eyes 
Like there's just, so there's probably like a lot of like don't eat me in our in our eyes. Yeah. Well, there, there are immune privilege sites in our body. Um, hmm. From what we understand, that that there is a barrier between the the systemic immune immune response to certain sites. Um, they, I mean, it's not entirely true that the 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 eye is completely immune privileged, but it is relatively immune privileged compared to other organs. Like brain is another one, which is supposed to be uh, immune privileged. However, now we know more uh, than before, and actually, it's not as immune privileged as we thought. So we, for instance, we we didn't know that the T cells could migrate into the brain. Natural killer cells could migrate into the brain. Now we know that's not entirely true. They 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 have found. Especially with age, we see more immune cells within the brain and attacking it. Same thing goes with eyes. I mean, they've shown that um, um, innate immune cells like neutrophils actually play an important role during eye development as well as eye uh, eye health. Are you um? I wonder how they so they're able to like get across the blood-brain barrier. Like, what's the normal thing that prevents um some things? From immune system from like going into the brain versus not going to the brain, what's degrading it over over time as we age? It is the blood brain barrier. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that that is what changes when we age, mm-hmm. and that disruption is what opens up. Then also there are like uh, resident immune cells within the brain that plays an important role. I mean, I'm not talking about you know microglia and astrocytes. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about natural killer cells. There are natural killer cells that do reside in um, in like for instance, don't take iris. Some people say these in natural killer cells actually migrate from systemic circulation into the brain and then reside there. Um, there is evidence to that. Yeah, but but most of the T cells that migrate into the brain are because of the disruption in blood brain barrier. Do, do do T cells cause inflammation? Because I know uh, Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disorders, like there's a lot of there's usually some inflammation with it as well. And that's usually, yeah. you know, when you're older. So I'm wondering if like all these like kind of like commingling ago. Yeah, I mean, like everything in immunology, this is a complicated question to answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could answer it both ways. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what you're getting to, if I understand this correctly, that they do make problem worse. So mm-hmm. there are uh, neurons, for instance, which have, uh, which has, which have all of the inflammatory signals. Um, but since we don't really necessarily replace our neurons, we don't really want to get rid of them too. Um, but they are sending out that signal, which is inflammatory, which will attract the immune cells. So part of what happens in our body is in addition to displaying those those eat me or don't eat me signals, uh, our normal cells also send out cytokines and chemokines, which are the sensory molecules. And the, the immune cells, natural killer cells, T cells, they basically slowly track the density of those receptors within our uh, you know environment and go towards the source, mm-hmm. just like a homing signal would. Um, so these cells, these uh, these uh, neuroblast cells, will produce those homing signals, and and we don't really want natural killer cells or T cells to attack those, and they do, and that can cause more inflammation. Okay, yeah. So it sounds like that might be an avenue for brain scientists to work on. And you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neuroinflammation and neuroimmunology has become really important. I mean, last few years people have uh, started looking into this quite, quite, quite. Yeah, it's, it's an exploding field right now. It's very, very mm-hmm. exciting to for people who work on your information these days. The, uh, this kind of goes back to my question about like ideas that you have that you don't get to explore. Are there uh, are there illnesses? What, you know, because you get to see so many different. Um, you get to understand the fundamentally like how the immune system works more. Are there illnesses that you think yeah. that you have like an idea on how they work that would result in like potentially um, a better understanding so we can like bite them better? Um, I'm thinking like more like, do you have like an idea on like how to cure Alzheimer's? But like, I'm thinking just more broadly because maybe it's like something with a liver or something that I don't even know. They have like a mm-hmm. weird, they've had like a thought and you're like, you know, I think I have an idea for like a, a liver inflammation or an immune system issue or like, uh, or something like that. Oh, we, we have some very interesting, uh, crazy ideas <laughs> for Alzheimer's that we're working on. I think it's too crazy to talk about them just yet. Mm. Uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, pretty straightforward, really. Like we, we think we can engineer antibodies to not only bind to oligomeric tau, which is what causes, uh, in my opinion, like pathology, uh, uh, Alzheimer pathology, we could we could break it down using those catalytic antibodies and and take care of them. We are at very very early stage, uh, and there are a lot of roadblocks in front of us. We are literally right now like testing the primary hypothesis, see if it is even possible. Uh, but that is something we're interested in working on. My like another problem that I really don't know, like I would like to get into, but I haven't gotten into is. Um, as we age, we we 
people tend to make a lot of auto antibodies um self reactive antibodies most of them don't really do anything um apparently nothing nothing obvious but the 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 kinds of antibodies we produce as we age goes up more and more i'm very interested in understanding how uh you know that how that affects our aging process per se um and the effects would be more systemic because of the fact that these antibodies are there in our circulation and those antigens shouldn't typically be observed uh, so i'm very interested in, in looking into that um, uh, at some point in time in my career yeah, yeah. i know you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that uh, math isn't something you're uh, you enjoy as much as other things so like this might not be this may be just a no but have you ever like sat down thought about all your ideas and like structured out like how much it would cost if like if the government if you were like to write a check like ask the government to write a check like how many mm-hmm. zeros or whatever it would take to like do all your ideas like have the staff just have like a giant like Amit Center. We just like explore your ideas. <laughs> How much that would well, cost? That, yeah. that would be an interesting center. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a fun uh, experiment though to like math that out. Be, it would be. It would be. And I think Lisa, if she hears this, will tell me that I shouldn't know this. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I think. I think that. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that, mm. but but I mean, research is an expensive uh, endeavor. Yeah. Like whatever we do is very very expensive. Like especially now when we're uh, slowly shifting all of our ideas. You know, now they're mature from in vitro to in vivo, um, uh, right? So and that becomes just the cost just exponentially grows. Um, I mean, typically, uh, my lab works on seven different projects. I mean, I think my my total operating cost just my lab. is um, is a little bit little bit less than a million dollars per year that's okay. a lot of money yeah. yeah i was thinking if that's a uh, if that's a month yeah that's a lot <laughs> like a million year no no yeah. no year year yeah 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 yeah. 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 yeah 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 but 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 still i think it's a lot of money you know like if you mm-hmm. if you were to talk like to write like this kind of like to be able to get that kind of funding from government we will have to spend on average um, about like 40% of my time per week just to write grants just to mm. write grants all the time yeah so what if there's like a volunteer op- uh, opportunity there for sense to cuz so many people who are like I don't have a technical background or whatever but I'd love to help out in longevity maybe all they do is just write write grants for everybody there's like a grant writing workshop and they just like write grants so they can see the impact of their work in that way they just you just have like a, a force of of people volunteering to to create the Amit center but plus everyone else as well Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean that's an interesting idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then uh I don't know, I'm sure you guys are getting to the end of the year where you're going to do like a like people donate to Sense cuz it's a non-profit. Um so maybe maybe there could be like a a I've always been a big fan of like when people do like Kickstarter type goals for non-stop. I I talked to Lisa about this. This was in the episode, but like I feel like, you know, uh you, you know, maybe there's like a you could like package all the different things that you do and then people could donate money cuz everyone I think that's like if a, if you get like a couple hundred thousand people to like donate like 10 bucks that's like mm-hmm. more, more than your budget by a large margin then you can even you can do even more um but yeah yeah we we actually have funded projects like that before uh, i don't know if lisa mentioned this or not uh, but there is this uh, mito mouse project that we had where mm-hmm. we wanted to uh, you know uh, express a gene that we had designed ourselves in in a mice to see how what happens that project is almost like finished i think they're writing it up soon uh, it'll be published um that was done basically just exactly the way you described people were told like this is what we want money for they were able to give us money and and um and uh, the mitosense group used it really well and you know the, the results will be showing pretty soon that, yeah we, we we've talked about that like right so what the one version of what you're saying we did last year was um, we we asked people to vote what strand of uh, mm-hmm. of sense would you fund if you were you know given a the free hand and then um, then then we would like call out proposals based on that mm-hmm. so we've done stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah i've i've been uh in the back of my head cuz i've talked to so many people at sense i've been working on like a framework to to see if like is it possible to raise 10 million dollars <laughs> as like a a large goal cuz i think that uh uh that would probably result in a lot of things um but we'll uh i'll probably have to email lisa about it i guess but, so anyway so that's <laughs> cuz uh, it would probably be useful. Uh because there's so many people. I mean, I I can't tell you how many people message me saying uh there's like been like three people this week. They're like, "I'm 71 years old. Tell them to hurry, tell them to hurry up." <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, "Yeah, okay. I mean, you know. Um 
So one thing I was reading, I think it was with the Adapto Sense. Uh, I don't remember which sense I was looking into to read about this, but it was related to the immune system. So I thought, like, you know, uh, we'll senesce in cells. So I thought I'd ask you about it. Um, cells also become dysfunctional with age due to the reactivation of the suppressed remains of ancient infections lurking in our genomes. And I, th- and I think it's like under reactivated retro transposons. Um, yeah. Like ancient infections. And I thought that was like a wild idea. Uh, there are ancient infections hiding in our genome. Absolutely. Uh, and wow. Andre Gutkoff, uh, I think he's, uh, um, uh, I can't remember where he's from right now, but uh, he's working on that. That's what they do, mm. essentially. They are looking at the reactivation. So um, a lot of our genome is just that, like retroposons that have been silenced. Uh, and what they're saying is that um, there is reactivation of the genome uh, or those genes within the genome, and that may be contributing to inflammation from within the cell. And Andre thinks that in addition to senescent cells, uh, the the reactivation of retroposons would be possibly contributing to activation of this. We have this uh, ancient immune uh, system within the cell. Um, it's called the C-casting uh, mm-hmm. pathway. And this recognizes the foreign DNA or foreign RNA, RNA within the cell. And that, that activates a TLA response and the, the cytokines are produced and interferon uh, uh, signaling signaling is activated, which then attracts in, in innate immune cells to come and attack. Now, in this case, you will be attacking cells that have an inflammatory response, but they you don't really want the immune system to come and attack. And then uh, the cytokines that are produced by these cells can also cause a systemic inflammation, uh, some, sometimes often called sterile inflammation. So you don't really have an infection, but your body assumes it is because you've produced uh, those kinds of cytokines in our body quite significantly. What they are doing right now, uh, if I may say so, uh, they're looking into part possibly using like drugs, like um, antiretroviral drugs as potential therapy for 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 like aging diseases where, where retroposon activation could be a potential problem. There was another paper, I can't remember where this came from. It was, I think, last year from UK, where they actually showed uh, viral capsids being formed in uh, in cells because of those retroposon activation. So pretty cool, mm-hmm. pretty pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to Google that after this and uh, see if I can link it in the show notes for everybody. The one one other thing that you do outside of sends is uh, you're in a fellowship with the Buck, I think, because uh, I don't write that down for some reason when I took my notes. Um, and there were two things you were doing, uh, but one of them uh, seemed wild to me, so I thought I'd ask you about it. So you're studying the role of gut, uh, oh. my. Okay, yeah, you know, you just take it for there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. what's that yeah. about? Well, so this was during my wild postdoc years. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that was that was that was a while ago. So um, okay. I did my postdoc uh, research from the Buck Institute uh, with Pankaj Kapai and Judy Um I was working in Pankaj Kapai's lab, and and his he was very interested in understanding the role of um, gut microbiome and gut, gut homeostasis. So one of the projects I initially got involved in is to understand how gut microbiome could affect the, the life life cycle of Drosophila, the lifespan of a Drosophila. We just mm-hmm. did some projects on this. Um, we didn't really get something conclusive. But while we were working on that project, we, uh, we I got interested in um, looking at um, the role of uh, genes, pro-survival genes in Drosophila, uh, lifespan and health span. Now, in a dirt fly, the only uh, homeostatically active tissue is the gut, uh, meaning the only 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 type of cell in the body that actually divides and and repairs damage, because most of the tissue is post mitotic um, in in Drosophila. So we 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 did this uh, Jiva screen where the lab there was a library of flies about I think five hundred different variations where there were some genes that were mutated. There was a slight difference in the genome of those flies. So when we radiated those adult flies, we found some mutations were protective in nature. Then uh, uh, they did a bioinformatics analysis and found like a, uh, some genes that were involved in um, in stem cell uh, function and repair. Um, it's called Musashi. We, we then showed that we messed with Musashi. We were able to manipulate a repair response in the gut in Drosophila and adult fly and were able to extend lifespan. There's another one that we found that uh, is um, is a is a um, uh, 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 it's a membrane protease which 
its main function is to chop off uh, proteins and then and then release them so a lot of you know like extracellular proteins or uh, proteins that are secreted from the cell um, actually have also a domain that tags them to the surface of the cell and you a protease would cleave it and then would release it and that's like a acute immune acute response to a specific type of challenge in this case inflammatory challenge we found that uh, that protein was apparently expressed in uh, in flies we found from the gmo skin we then tried to test it and found that actually it was also important in cellular senescence uh, so the cytokines several cytokines and chemokines um, were produced from senescent cells were actually inhibited or were not released from the cell when you knock down this particular gene uh, that work we're still writing up uh, trying to finish it up okay yeah, but that yeah, so that was my involvement in that yeah, look, it sounded wild. I was like, I googled uh, some of the terms because you know I'm not a scientist. Uh, I just play one on TV, but and I was like, oh, this <laughs> seems like it could be quite wild. Uh, so, from uh, post write up, is is anything going to be dying? It like, is the sense or anyone going to continue on with the research to see what else can become from it? Well, an offshoot of that project was the work that we did with paracrine senescence, right? So oh, okay. we wanted to understand because it was affecting the release of cytokines. I got interested in understanding how paracrine senescence occurs. Uh, we found, um, you know, like uh, this is how we came to ferroprocess. Found that actually primary senescent cells are different from paracrine senescent cells in terms of their pro-survival pathways. They seem to require different pro-survival pathways. And then uh, in that investigation, found ferroprocess was probably important um, mechanism, a common thread between those. We we said, okay, can we kill them both with 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 ferroprocess inducers? We were. Then we found, okay, is there a safer way to kill them? And, and that that iron product approach that that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it's a bit of a convoluted thing, you know. Like we start with something somewhere, and then it leads to something completely, you know, interesting somewhere else. Um, it, they, we are also following up a little bit on on that. You know, we, we think that in addition to releasing cytokines and chemokines, senescent cells produce other things too, which may be causing systemic inflammation. Um, I, I can't talk much about that. But I mm -hmm. think we may have found a whole another class of molecules that are being uh, released from cells and cells, which may be doing a lot more than what we initially thought. Wow. Maybe yeah, it goes back to your system yeah. aging. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah the, uh, I was just thinking, like, uh, sorry for the, uh, I was just thinking, it goes back to your point earlier, like, man, there's just, like, come uh, stuff all over the place, it sounds. And you get to see, like, all this, like, stuff popping off. Yeah. Yeah, well, I my career, my research career was never really, like, you know, planned. I just went into something that was exciting and kept doing it and never really thought, like normally, you know, we talk to someone, they'll give you advice and I would give the same advice to people, you know, like pick a lane, stay in that lane, develop the expertise and then, then you know, you have a more straightforward career in research. I, on the other hand, have gone to various different things, you know, like my PhD was on microRNAs. Uh, microRNAs, if you know, these are these uh, small um, mRNA molecules or like small RNA molecules are produced in our cells and that can bind to three prime uh, UTR and translated region of mRNA, another layer of regulation. So they bind to those UTR and can lower their expression. So it's like another way by which cell can fine tune the regulation. So we found, I think we were the first ones to find microRNAs that can regulate cytokines. And I mm -hmm. found that this uh, microRNA, in, in my case, we found that mid uh, 106A was an important regulator of a cytokine uh, interleukin 10, which is an important cytokine regulating the uh, the anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory response in the lung. So that lab was working on uh, airway inflammation. Um, I found that if we block that particular microRNA um, in mice, we, we use like antisense of those microRNAs and were able to show that it's by 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 blocking those, we were able to reduce a lot of inflammatory response in the lung of the of the mice and. Uh, and you know these mice were not developing the 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 fibrotic response that you'd see otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, then I got interested in microRNA regulatory pathways, you know, after my PhD, and and wanted to follow up on that. So um, this particular microRNA family is also very important during development. And at that time, uh, this was um, I think 2009, 2010, and there was big interest in understanding reprogramming, like different ways we can reprogram cells and make iPS cells. Uh, Yamanaka factors had just come in like in 2000, I think it was 2008, 2009. I can't remember, maybe I'm wrong about the dates, but right around that time, it was pretty big. And um, I started working in a lab at Stanford um, 
uh, where they were interested in looking at microRNAs as potential ways to reprogram cells. So my interest being in MIR-106A family, um, I went over and, and, and started working on this, but kind of got scooped. Um, but one thing that we were doing on the side was to see whether we can reprogram uh, fibroblasts from human subjects. And uh, what I found was that when I was trying to reprogram fibroblasts from uh, somebody who's like 70 year old versus somebody who's like 20 years old, I found that there were fewer reprogrammed colonies that would appear on the plate. Mm. Um, we, we found that they actually found some micronic connection over there too. It seems like there was a micronic uh, uh, mirror 766 that was regulating um, C26 and then messing with this reprogramming efficiency. Uh, but this is what got me interested in the first place. Like, what changes are happening in these cells that they, they behave so differently than younger cells? And this is how I got into in aging. Um, and, I, and I decided to do another postdoc at the park and started working uh, over there um, and, and worked on those, those projects that I just described to you. And that's how I got interested in uh, uh, senescence and started working some, uh, you know, did some basic biology on senescence in that lab uh, over there. When I got this job uh, opportunity at Sense, I was able to marry my previous experiences in the immune system and micro and senescence and, and, and started working here. Yeah, but the, yeah. you never know how things are going to come together. It's like only in uh, hindsight do you see like the line kind of connecting yeah. up, which is like which kind of sucks in the moment if you're like really trying to figure out where you're supposed to go. It's like, well, I don't mm -hmm. have the line to draw the the pattern from. It's like you just kind of. Yeah. I think wait, the the big takeaway I took from what you're saying is like you really just kept following what was really interesting to you. Like you were yeah. really like going down deeper, deeper, deeper. And I think that, um, especially if you're talking about like this type of this research, this type of technology, um, I mean, it's, you're going to come out the other side with some level of uh, knowledge base that you can apply to a, a sense or a buck or something else like that, that then you will find a home, which is what you did. The, the, um, the, the other thing that happens though, right? Like with this approach, uh, and this wasn't accidentally, I wasn't really thinking about it like this, is that you always have this outsider mentality. You know, you're always mm -hmm. looking at a problem from another perspective. So I working on those different models, you know, the cell culture, the mouse models, the, the senescence, you know, the microRNAs and, and all of those, it, you always look at a problem and, and, and try and look at it from a different perspective that people who've been working on a field long enough wouldn't. So, mm -hmm. so it just gives you more tools to you know solve a problem i think so that was just a happy accident of, yeah. of me chasing all of those that was never really my plan <laughs> yeah the, and then uh I, I pinged some people uh for you coming on and uh sends actually shared it around as well so i just want to say thanks to sends and i don't know who uh, did the sharing but if uh if you say your name i'll thank you in the future videos when you share stuff that uh for people coming on the show um so this person's name is barrel master he shows up a lot uh barrel master if you had like a first name i'd give it i'd use that instead but i'm finally using barrel master so uh oh there's a really good question i think uh, how, and then you'll tell me it's really uh, boring but uh how do you know the allergenic car nk cells won't cause graft versus host diseases how do we know if allergenic car would cause uh well natural killer cells um uh, th there will be some group, uh you know host versus uh graft rejection there, there will be some mm -hmm. um and what what I envision in the future is that they, we could haplo, haplotype uh, current case. So we do see, like the main reason why we are able to distinguish between self, non-self, is because we have these proteins in our body called major histocompatibility protein, uh, MSC1 and MSC2. Uh, mostly NK cells look for the differences in the expression of MSC1 and within MSC1, their variability. But but we do share some haplotypes between, between individuals. So I think if we were to transplant current care from um, allergenic, um, then we would probably be less of an immune response, less of, less of a host versus graft rejection. If we were doing, I um, mean, sorry, uh, if you're doing like self uh, cell transplantation, probably would be less of it. When we're doing allergenic, there will be a little bit more of it. And if you match haplotypes of individuals, then we could limit the, the immune response. The good thing about car, car NK cells is they're not very long lived, so you don't really have to induce a suicide gene, and and you could get rid of them. I mean, the larger scheme of things, the way I think about this, especially for for car NK project, is that I think for most people who are looking to extend their lifespan, they're, they're thinking about starting intervention sooner. Uh, most people would probably use drugs like synolytics, the kind of 
the ones we're working on the second generation and third generation cell analytics we're working on so they are they are pushing the problem like further down the road you can live like much healthier um, in your like 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s car in care would be more useful for people who have diseases where senescence has become an acute problem and you want to solve an acute problem with a very effective tool and that is where this will become effective uh, yeah. in it so in the in, in a long winded way what i'm trying to say is that we will probably have a library of car in cares that we would use um and and we would haplotype match with 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 the subject before those are administered to people mm-hmm. however um, we are also working on other types of human cells which would be i think far more superior than even car in cares can talk much about it right now we're yeah. writing up a paper and it'll come out soon mm-hmm. Well, it's you know, it's like it's like a teaser, you know, when you say, "Hey, we have something cool coming up around." It just makes people go to the website more and you know subscribe to your guys' newsletter. Um, so he had, he had a series of questions, and uh, Bear Monster shows up a lot, so I'm just going to ask all of them. Uh, how many? I think we were talking about different markers actually, but uh, how many possible senescent cell markers do you think there may be in senescent cells? Do you see being able to target, say, seventy percent of senescent cells with just say ten markers? I think it's like one of those like eighty twenty principles. Like, can you hit eighty percent of the results with like twenty percent? Yeah, so that's a that's a harder question to answer, and mm. math has never been my, my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the challenge is that senescent cells are so like normal cells in our body that it it is a it has been a challenge to find something which is unique to senescent cells, right? I mean, cancer cell is an advantage when you're trying to target cancer cells on CAR T. There is an advantage we have, where um, individual cancer cells have gen, you know mutations, which which can then allow presentation of novel antigens. uh new antigens that 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 are unique to that cancer right so you can design car t towards that cancer and make it a little bit more specific senescent cells because they're healthy cells they just have a phenot they are normal cells they just have a phenotype which is which is slightly different um when we try to so we found some markers that we think are senescent specific we still have to perform safety profile to make sure that those markers are not transiently expressed in other tissue which possibly maybe like remember we were talking about these proteins that we found that we're targeting um mm-hmm. you know like we found there were these mem- like repair proteins that were expressing in the cells when we mess with that repair process they die some of those markers we're also developing car therapies for or using them as senescent markers the problem is there are normal cells in our body that use the exact same repair process too but the expression of those proteins may be a lot a lot more transient than what we see in senescent cells so there may still be some room to target them um what we are also doing though is uh, is uh, we use, we did uh, uh, phage display analyses to to identify surface molecules or surface markers for senescent cells you know in this case we found peptides that bind to motifs on senescent cells not not specific proteins but motifs which is more likely to be uh, more universal than than individual markers so i think the question the the question was that every senescent cell is different depending on what like endothelial cell that once it becomes senescent would be different than say a, a, a fibroblast or you know like a, an epithelial cell so how likely is it that a marker would be expressed in all of those cell types that's really essentially the question so so if you found that more than say a marker which is unique to fibroblast when they become senescent would be different so if you combine those would you be able to target them all that essentially is the question um i think the answer is that we may have to find as common list of unique markers that we could find and then target them based on that um I, i yeah it's hard to it's hard to say at this point in time yeah. uh, in a mathematical terms what that would look like mm-hmm. and then the i think the last question from barrel master today will be how far do you think how far do you think you are from an ind application i don't know what ind is So maybe I have to. Oh, so so this is the kind of application you're submitting before you start a clinical trial. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. So I I I would say that uh, you know I'm always going to err on the side of caution. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so not that far. Uh, I would say uh, right now we are at preclinical stage. We we are almost ready to finish some of the in vivo experiments and mouse models um, of the drugs and the cells we're working with. the good thing is that everything we're working on is the drugs that we're working on for instance are already you know like safe for human consumption they've been safe for human consumption or other things and the cells we're working on 
that we want to propose a cell therapy for for senescence or senescence related diseases are also being considered safe for human use in other contexts right so the bar that we have to cross would be lower then you know say like a, a novel drug if you we were working on some completely new compound that has no safety profile from before um so i would say that that we are with a reason i mean i i would i can totally see after in vivo experiments that, that we've done that in a, in a, in a few years we we should be able to start asking for uh, uh, for 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 approval to 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 start some kind of clinical trial again a lot of it depends on how good those data are how solid those data are um what what i like to do is to not um just focus on one model of a disease or one type of cell i want to test my ideas in different models so we get we get more confidence that it is robust and it's more useful um that's what we will be will be doing um but the path is pretty straightforward once we are once we are sure that that in, in at least in the labs these are safe things to work with mm-hmm. It's there. Uh, it seems like they were had a last question that was buried in here. The is there any orphan indication you would want to target first, or is it too soon to know like that type of targeting? I really like uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as a disease model mm-hmm. to, to work with. So lung fibrosis is what I'll go after. I mean, it's a it's a nasty disease. You know, people there is no treatment uh, till date that that would work. Um, there is a clear role of senescence in the lung that. that is involved in the pathology of the disease um so something and you know people who get diagnosed with it they don't really have that much longer to live and it's it's a nasty disease if you if you know about it you know you'll eventually if eventually your lung becomes you know inflexible there is so much fibrosis so much inflammation that people literally drown in their own uh, you know uh, with their own uh, mucus and it's just horrible so that's one thing that I want to target at some point in time all right then um what books uh you're a book reader like me so we know you got Elon Musk uh on the table what else are you, would you uh, are you reading or that you recommend people read based on the, what you've enjoyed the last couple of years or last six months or whatever i don't know how fast you read uh, i yeah i i read and i also listen to books when i'm driving mm-hmm. um so that that helps that kind of you know like i think some people are ashamed of saying that they ought to use audio books i am not you know um it it helps me multitask a little bit um I, i've read uh, recently you know this book about um, uh, i'm listening to uh, and reading this book about you know um, um elon musk in addition to that uh, the simon sedek book that i was talking about about leadership um then i like to i've read the biography of einstein that i thought was very very interesting and fascinating oppenheimer is this book about oppenheimer the movie i think there was a movie recently uh, mm-hmm. that based on that book so i think i read a lot of biographies there is um, i'm also interested in theology i don't know if the question was about science i'm just telling the no, you go anywhere yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i have to go anywhere yeah so i am very interested in the the politics and theology and evolution of monotheistic religion and how that shaped our you know societies and and our you know uh, current politics so i'm very interested in that trying to draw connections you know what um what are the sources of inspiration of people there is a really book uh, this book that i i think i found very fascinating was um about uh, it's called um, evolution of god i can't remember the name of the author so that's also a pretty interesting book to read um then there is a interesting book that i that i read it's a big book if you if you could spend time reading it um it's looking at the second world war through the eyes of um, of um of churchill and and gandhi uh, mondas mm. campaign so basically comparing you know how the the you know india or 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 you know that part of the world looked at the second world war and the politics that went into you know the time british were you know occupying india so, so just just all, all all kinds of stuff there yeah there, there's a book called the immortality key that i think you'd enjoy oh, yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I've, i've i've read that book yeah Okay, yeah. yeah. I yeah. uh it just, yeah, it seems right up your alley. The um you have to check out the Churchill and Gandhi book, the the like I guess like the disintegration of Amer- of the UK's uh colonies, I don't know what to call how they mm-hmm. uh attributed. Yeah, probably- okay. Yeah, I don't know if there's like a special name for them, but uh it, it's like uh it's an interesting period of time. Like they went from like mm-hmm. a dominant 
place in the world and then everyone was like i don't want to be a part of your club anymore and they're like well it's not like we just fought the nazis so we can't really fight yannin anymore yeah i'll have to check that out that's an interesting period of time and then um is there uh one, one question uh and this will be like last question because i know we're coming to the end um like i guess the future for yourself the i was listening to a talk by george church and he said that he basically never wants to stop doing science like that's his thing um he never wants to stop because he thinks there's just so much that he can contribute do you have like a do you have a spot where you know, like, you will retire? Do you intend to retire? Like, what's the what's the future hold for you? Essentially, no, I'm not. I'm not retiring. I mean, I have. Um, this is the most exciting thing in my life. I absolutely love doing the work that I do. I'm, I'm privileged to be able to do this work. You know, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I will retire. Okay. Yeah. So this is it. This is like. This is it. You, well, you found it, and you're okay. And yeah. then, uh, is there just like a part two of that? Is there anything people listening in could help you with? Is there a problem you're having, uh, a topic you're curious about. I think like monotheistic religion um, expansion and it might be a topic, uh, but is there anything in particular you'd ask the audience to help you with? I think, um, you know, asking engaging questions, the kind of questions they're asking, I think will be good. Like joining our mission. People, I think sometimes we, we get too pessimistic about the future. I'm mm -hmm. not pessimistic at all. Uh, you know, like, for instance, like th there is this like huge amount of pessimism about you know global warming, all of the political divide that is going on right now everywhere, you know all of that. Um, I think we should all. Uh, I personally feel that technology. We've also humanity. The our history has always been us using technology to make our life better and longer, and then at some point in time. Um, that technology leads to a problem, then we find new technology to solve that problem. I think global war global warming is also a problem that was created by our misuse of technology and, and technology is how we will solve that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think if people are thinking about it like this, that, that these are the problems that we can overcome collectively if our focus is in, in making us live longer, healthier and happier, that would be the way to go. Um, so engaging with us, you know, like scientifically uh, um, and and um, and contributing to us financially um, would would be a very good step in the right direction. And and opportunities like this, I think, before we started this, I, I said how important it is, you know, in today's day and time, uh, the work you do um, is very important because I think we are horrible in. I mean, I should say we. I mean, I. I think people like me are horrible in communicating our science in a way that normal people can find engaging um, and excited about. So, you know, doing that kind of work as well is absolutely critical. Um, when right now the the trust in institutions and trust in in science has actually plummeted, uh, these kinds of communications that we're having now this this is very very helpful. Um, and and engagement like that would would be something we would we would find encouraging too. And if you do donate, uh, I think it's a tax write-off, and there usually is a comment section. So say for the Amit Center, uh, so that they know where to put the money. <laughs> the, uh, but um, Amit, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, Michael Ray as well, thank you for connecting us and, and telling me about uh, your work and you know how exciting it is. Um, but Amit, thank you for coming on. And uh, just a special note, uh, Amit and I are introverts, so like this, like this the comment, like oh, we're not you know uh, getting better at communicating. Like it's it's hard to do this type of work as well. So I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much for giving me time and thank you so much for uh, giving me the exposure you know that this will give us and um, and uh, yeah absolutely thanks thanks for everything take care